So welcome to the introduction to thermal fluid sciences. We'll be using the text Fundamentals of Thermal Fluid Science, 4th edition. This book is published through McGraw-Hill. And I'll be using the publisher presentations that uh, were provided with the text. My name is Norman Love. I am currently an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. And I'll be delivering these presentations to you in this format for the semester. We will also be working a uh, problems on a separate uh, presentations that I will be providing to you throughout the semester. All these presentations should be available to you through YouTube. So what are we going to be talking about when we talk about thermal fluid sciences? We are talking about energy the transfer of energy, transport, conversion of energy from one form to another. Here in this example on the right you see solar energy being converted into heat. Uh, the heat is being collected by what looks like water which is flowing through the solar collectors. The water then uh, is collected in a hot water tank and can be used for a shower and here we see all three examples of thermodynamics, the change in temperature of the water, the energy transfer, we see heat transfer, the rate at which the water is increasing, the rate at which energy is being transferred in this system, and fluid mechanics, the flow through the pipe would be a good example of that. There are many applications of thermal fluid sciences in the real world. Starting from the top left, we see refrigerators, which use a lot of thermodynamics. Boats, which use a lot of principles from fluid mechanics. For example, buoyancy, drag on the ship. Aircraft are a great example where we have jet engines, which are follow thermodynamics very closely. Many examples can be drawn from there. And we also have the fluid passing over the plane, over the wings, over the um, different components of the plane, creating lift and drag. Cars, the human body, various other examples. What I would like you to take from this slide, and I would like you to think about, is what you would like to do as you progress through your engineering career. If you can think about one of these applications or something that you enjoy doing, there is probably an application of thermodynamics or heat transfer in that area. If you're interested in the human body, fluid mechanics, we have blood flowing through veins. Heat transfer, we have heat being transferred off the body continuously. Power plants, do you guys want to make energy more efficient? Do you want to invent a new way to convert energy from one form to another? Many different applications can be found and I challenge you to think about what you enjoy doing. So thermodynamics is the study of energy. Literally, if we look at the Greek, the word means heat and power. A key cornerstone of what we're going to be talking about in this course is the conservation of energy principle, which says the energy is, con energy is converted from one form to another but cannot be created or destroyed. In other words, energy is conserved. In this example we see potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy as this boulder falls off the cliff and begins to move. We'll also apply other types of energy, internal energies, flow energies, work, heat, and we'll balance these in what's called the first law of thermodynamics which is essentially the conservation of energy. So what we're going to be doing is we are really just going to be summing up 
and making sure that all the energy is accounted for in our systems that we define. So keep this in mind as we progress through future chapters. A cornerstone, and I hope one of the things that you leave from this class with, is that energy is conserved. It's not created or destroyed. Another topic we'll be touching on towards the end of the thermodynamics module is that energy has a quality to it as well as a quantity. And uh, we will really just be getting into the details of that later on introducing topics such as entropy. Now there are two different types of thermodynamics that we could study. One is the classical approach, another is a statistical approach. The statistical approach will have to do typically has to do with microscopic or on a molecular level how is energy transferred from one set of particles to another. In our class we will be taking the classical approach where we'll be looking at things on a macroscopic scale. So we're going to be combining all the effects of these particles and assuming that they work together in a system. The classical approach in many cases is what you will find in practice. Although there are plenty of positions where you may need the statistical approach to thermodynamics. But that will not be presented here. It could be taken in another course. Another topic that we will not cover in this class but that is relevant is heat transfer. Heat transfer will be presented to you in a future upper level division course. And what I'd like to do with this slide though is just introduce you to what is the difference between heat transfer and thermodynamics. Well, thermodynamics is really interested in understanding what happens from one equilibrium state to another. But we really don't know how long it takes to get from one equilibrium state to another. If we want to know the rate or the time it takes, for example, for this hot coffee mug or this thermos to cool down, we need to apply principles from heat transfer. We will not be covering heat transfer in this class, but we may be seeing several applications of heat transfer as we go through this course, and I'll try to point them out as we see them. Another important topic that we're going to be dealing with is fluid mechanics. Now fluid mechanics is ubiquitous. We can see it almost everywhere. The air that we're surrounded by is an example of fluid mechanics. Now the word fluid mechanics is divided into two words. One fluid, the other mechanics. For this class we will define the fluid as something that deforms continuously when exposed to a shear stress. Even if the shear stress is really small. If we have a solid and we expose it to a shear stress, it will deform. And in some cases will stay that way. However, the liquid will continuously deform under the influence of shear stress. Another term we're using here is mechanics. Mechanics here refers to the combination of the study of statics and dynamic components of fluid, either stationary or moving flow. So when we refer to fluid mechanics, we're talking both about fluid statics and fluid dynamics. Here's an example of what we would consider as a solid. If we apply a shear stress to a rubber, it will deform. If we apply a shear stress to a liquid, it will continuously deform. Here you see an example of a liquid and a gas, both with no shear stress applied to them, so they're at rest. In a case where they're at rest, pressure is the only pressure is the only normal stress on this fluid. Later on we'll be talking about how we calculate pressure at different locations from what is indicated here as the free surface. 
The free surface in many diagrams we'll be drawing is indicated by this upside down triangle. As a side note to other things we'll be covering in this class, an important part of it is also dimensions and units. This is very important and many times when we talk about this, people tend to shut their mind off because we're talking about units. One common mistake I see during the classes is that students tend to neglect these units leading to mistakes in their final answer, ultimately costing them points towards their final grade. A very common mistake is the conversions between using these prefixes here as you see in table 1.2. For example, many students make the mistake of not converting between kilopascal and pascal, kilojoule and joule, perform the calculation and are typically off by a factor of about a thousand. If not, another factor because of some other calculation error that resulted from that. Another thing I would like to point out is that your units in an equation should be homogeneous. So you cannot add kilojoules to joules without a conversion between them. You also cannot add kilojoules to watts. So be careful when you're writing out your equations. Make sure the units are homogeneous. The units that we will be using for this class are the primary units of length, mass, time, and temperature. We will be dealing only with the SI system with only a few applications in the English system, but probably 90% or so of the class will be using the SI system. Here is a problem solving technique provided by the authors of this textbook. I strongly recommend you guys follow it. There's several steps involved in breaking up a problem, but you may ask yourself, why would I break up a problem? I'm perfectly capable of solving this problem without necessity of following these steps. And that may be true. I recommend it because as you progress through your engineering career, you're going to be facing harder and harder problems. When we break these hard problems down into smaller steps, it really can make a hard problem much easier. If you list what assumptions you're making, the governing equations that you're going to use, how we can simplify these equations based on the assumptions you make, it will make your life much easier. Here we see somebody going the easy way up this mountain, mountain representing a problem, and somebody going up the hard way. And uh, you uh, have a choice, specifically uh, later on in this class and others, when problems become much harder. So I strongly recommend that you follow along with a procedure where you f um, follow the assumptions, gather your information that you have, and solve your problem. Just a remark on significant digits now. A typical thing that I find is that students tend to list their answer. For example, here in figure 130, we see the student has listed the answer as 3.16875, which is five points after the decimal place. Now, what, is that, what does that tell me when I see somebody write that? That tells me that you're confident of your answer to the fifth decimal place and that if we were to take a measurement that we could measure something to the fifth decimal place which is very accurate and may not be the case so what I would strongly recommend you do is typically 
represent and round your answer to maybe two or one point after the decimal, depending on what is applicable. This represents something that can be measured typically in the laboratory. <laughs> we may have a scale that can measure two points after the decimal. It may be more rare to find a scale that can measure five points after the decimal place, if at all. So that's the introduction to this class. In summary, we'll be talking about thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and we'll continue our next lecture talking about thermodynamics. I look forward to working with all, with all of you this semester, and I wish you the best throughout the class. Thank you.